Hello, folks. So, for my last presentation, I'm going to be talking about a uh, important, but also sometime somewhat uh, troubling novel by the author Fritz Lieber, which has had a lot, great deal of influence, but was also a product of its time, but precisely because it's a product of its time, I think it tells us something about how far we've gone, but also how far we might potentially fall back. So turning to my presentation, Today, I'm going to be talking to you about witchcraft in the novel Conjure Wife by Fritz Lieber. So, who the heck is this Fritz Lieber guy? Have any of you ever heard of him before? Well, if you haven't, that's a telling point because he was an American short story writer, a novelist, a poet, also an actor. Also, if that wasn't enough, he was a chess expert. He lived from 1910 to 1992. He is the one that coined the expression sword and sorcery for that genre. Uh, he was a speech and drama instructor at Occidental College during the 1941 to 1942 academic year, but he totally disdained academic politics, which will become very evident when I tell you about the story of the novel Conjure Wife. So also he won uh, a number of awards, um, including the Hugo Award, so the Critics Award for the quality of his writing in the uh, context of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Oh, and here's a picture. So Conjure Wife, what the heck is this? Well, it's a novel, well, originally a novel. Uh, it was eventually specifically rewarded what's called a retro Hugo. I guess the critics that uh, award the Hugo also sometimes acknowledge past works that they neglected to award. It has also received multiple movie adaptations, the earliest one being the movie Weird Woman, which starred Lon Chaney and Gwen and Evelyn Eggers in the 1940s. Then a bit later, I think 60s or 70s, Night of the Eagle, which was a British uh, horror movie. And then about 1980 or so, Witch's Brew, which, as you can see from this image, starred Terry Gar and uh, Richard Benjamin, both actors who were known for doing um, mostly humorous movies and significantly, whereas the other two are horror movies, this one is a horror comedy. So what the heck is just the story here? a professor of sociology in a small Midwestern liberal arts college who is up for the chairmanship of his department suddenly discovers that his wife has been practicing witchcraft. He is an uber rationalist. And so he convinces her to do away with all the charms and totems that she has been covertly um, gathering in order to protect his career. Well, she goes along with it, but as soon as all those are gone away, his career, well, it goes into, can I say, is this acceptable to say his career goes into the um, crapper? One thing after another, after another goes wrong, he loses the chairmanship. Well, Then something terrible happens because she does one last piece of magic to re re redirect any antagonistic magic that's being sent towards him 
against her as a noble act of self-sacrifice. But the result is that her soul is essentially taken. Chapter 14, spoiled, um, linked, spoiler alert. And he has a wife who has no soul. She's alive, but she, all she is is basically a database. So he proceeds to question her, challenge her, ask her about the nature of witchcraft, and she sets out forth a in, internally consistent theory about magic. That magic is noble, but it's noble primarily by intuition. Men in this context are understood to be entirely or primarily rational and not having as much access to intuition as women do. Also, however, women are so entirely competitive with each other that, um, that they seldom, if ever, do magic together. And as a result, um, as a result, the problem is that on this particular college campus, three, not one, not two, but three, hmm, she who is three, where have we encountered this image before? Three different women, faculty, wives, or have been plotting together to advance their husband's careers and to attack our protagonist's career. And so he has to go on a journey of exploration to find different um, magical formulae. But then he reduces these magical formulae to symbolic logic and he gets the husband of one of the three women, who is a mathematician, to use symbolic logic to find out, figure out a uber spell that will ultimately, again, spoiling our words, although this time in advance, save his wife's soul. Well, hmm. What can we make about this, make of this story? Well, for the one thing, it's a really very early example of cross genre writing. He's combining horror, fantasy, and maybe science fiction all together. It anticipates modern fantasy and borders upon science fiction. In fact, the first time I heard about this story was when I was reading a book about science fiction and an author argued that this was actually a work of science fiction because it was setting forth the notion that magic works but it works in some sort of rationalistic discoverable fashion with internally consistent laws. Um, but personally I think it's all the more interesting because by our own contemporary standards, it is technically, I'm um, telling me, dated. Or is it? I'll get back to that in a sec. Because it assumes a world where men and women exist in largely discrete worlds. You have a woman's world where magic and intuition and emotion are the default, and a man's world. Yes, I grew up at a time where the a man's world was an actual phrase people used without irony. A man's world which is mostly defined by logic and reason. But anyway, we look at the story, it's gender essentialist. Men are per se rational and women are per se intuitive and emotional. I don't buy it. A man, if you hadn't noticed. Um, I have intuition, I do have emotions, I own them and acknowledge them. But also, the notion that women covertly ex exercise dominion via their mastery of magic, well, if that was the case, why was mid-century 
mid-20th century America so very, very patriarchal. If women had all so much power, why weren't they in charge? However, the women's world is so competitive that they seldom, if ever, work cooperatively. The big bad in this novel is not because one woman or two women are doing magic, but three women are doing magic together cooperatively. Shut up. Finally, we have the white savior syndrome. The first person male narrator being introduced to world of magic uses his superior rationality to redeem and save his wife. Where have we seen this before? Lawrence Arabe of Arabia, most of the works of Roger Kipling, just saying. And that's where I think this work is intriguing and informative, because right now what we're seeing are coordinated attacks against people that are LGBTQ, drag queens, not necessarily the same thing, women's reproductive choices and power of the recent Supreme Court opinion, um, technically throwing uh, the notion of abortion rights to the states, and um, Rumor has it that the far right, the Federalist Society, their next uh, target is contraception, which applies to both men and women. So I have to ask you, at this time, and with, with what's going on in the far, far right currently, is this novel so much a matter of its time, dated, obscure, irrelevant? Or does it presage where the far right wants us to return to? That's my question. These are my sources. So, there you go. One final note. And while I was researching this, I was a little surprised to discover that there's an odd linkage between all three of my presentations today. Fritz Leiber is most noted for his sword and sorcery stories about two uh, adventurers, Bofford and the Grey Mouser. And the uh, Balford is a barbarian hero, and the Grey Mouser is a thief who works by subtlety and stone. Uh, and a lot of these stories center on, on a mythical city called Moncro. Terry Pratchett admitted that the inspiration for a central city in a number of his Discworld stories Anka Morpok was informed by his appreciation of Fritz Leiber's description of Lankara. And of course, Neil Gaiman personally um, collaborated with Tari Pratchett in his novel, or well, their novel, Good Omens. So Fritz Leiber links to Terry Pratchett, links to Neil Gaiman. This is what's called the history of ideas. And I've been pushing them back one level at a time. So for your consideration, that is my presentation. I will be uploading this to YouTube. Anyone who reads this or watches this, um, please, Share with me your feedback. Am I going too far making this connection between Fritz Leiber to Terry Pratchett to Neil Gill? Also, doesn't that suggest something about where we are, but sadly also where we could go back to? There's my thoughts, there's my observations. Please share your comments. Thank you.